Hey, shalom everybody. How you doing? Good evening, good afternoon. Should all be good <laughs> wherever you are. Nice to see you again. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate uh, all the many people who have joined me for these uh, wonderful sessions. Uh, one on Pier Avot Monday nights or afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, one tonight, Wednesday nights, on five Derech Haaretz lessons in the Torah portion. So I'm very, very happy that you're with us. Hello to all of my good friends in Stanford, Connecticut, and in Baltimore, Maryland, and Providence, uh, other places. Great to uh, see you, and great that you're here. So today we celebrated, maybe if you're in the United States, another place you're just still celebrating, Israel's 72nd birthday, Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel's 72nd anniversary of independence. So, And um, I also want to wish a very happy birthday to my dear aunt, aunt, Bracha Adler. She is my one and only aunt. Isn't that amazing? Uh, my mother, uh, she should rest in peace, had no uh, siblings. She was an only child. My father, he should rest in peace, had one brother who was murdered in the Holocaust. Another brother, my uncle David, he should rest in peace. Uh, and uncle David was married to uh, Bracha, who's my aunt, who's 90 today. So mazel tov, Bracha. Uh, David and Bracha have two children, Edna and Danny. And so I have exactly one aunt, one uncle, and two cousins. So happy birthday, Bracha. Many, many more in good health. You're wonderful. We love you. And uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to be talking to you on Zoom. How do you like that? So uh, this week, you have a, a double portion, and it's called Acharemot and Kedoshim. So here is the Derech Haaretz lesson number one from these double portions. And there are five, I think these are five uh, delicious, amazing lessons on how to be a mensch. Derech Haaretz, how to be a mensch. So uh, here is lesson number one. Uh, today, this week's, this Shabbat is Acharemot and Kedoshim. And then the following week is called Emor. If you string these three portions together, they come out to Acharemot Kedoshim Emor. It happens to be a phrase on its own. In other words, those three names of Torah portions, three consecutive, Acharemot Kedoshim Emor, they happen to make out a phrase in Hebrew, uh, which means, um, <clears throat> after death, say holy things. After death, say holy things. Acharemot, after somebody dies, Kedoshim Emor, Say the holy things. What does that mean? This means to say that after somebody dies, after somebody has passed away, at a funeral, say the nicest things. Now, you may think, of course I'm going to say the nicest things. <laughs> Who's going to come up at a funeral and eulogize and say not nice things? Frankly, I've heard it. Not often, thank God, but occasionally somebody will slip in a little something that's not the most complimentary. But basically, it's telling us that after somebody has passed away, we should try to re remember the nice things about them, the kind things, the sweet things. After somebody passes away, we should try to let go of a grudge. It doesn't necessarily mean to put that person on a pedestal. Maybe they don't belong there. You know, people have different kinds of relationships. But what it does mean is it means that after somebody dies, to be kind and to be gentle when speaking about them and when thinking about them. Acharemot, after somebody dies, kedoshim emor, say holy or nice or kind or sensitive things. That's the traditional or the classic message of stringing these three Torah portion names together. There is another way that is very, very reminiscent of a, a day we had not too long ago called Yom HaShoah the day of Holocaust remembrance, where we remember all of the Holocaust victims, the six million Jews and others uh, whose lives were taken in the most brutal uh, of fashions. So I'm going to punctuate the sentence differently. Acharemot kedoshim, after the death of holy ones, kedoshim, after the death of holy ones, emor, you have to say, after the death of holy ones, you have to say, so what does that mean? It means to say that just like when we had Yom HaShoah a few days ago, the day of uh, Holocaust remembrance, you know, statistically, Holocaust survivors are not going to last forever. 
Most of them are now in their 70s, 80s, 90s, perhaps even more. And unfortunately, every year, a significant amount of Holocaust survivors pass away. Uh, my uncle David was a Holocaust survivor. My parents were Holocaust survivors. Uh, in the thousands every year, you have to imagine, because they're getting older and older. So once a Holocaust survivor passed away, passes away, who is going to tell their story? Who's going to fill in that gap? when the survivor himself or herself is not able to tell their story and verify that the Holocaust actually happened because here we have primary witnesses. After they're gone, who's going to tell their story? And the answer is us, we, not the French. <laughs> we have to tell their story. Acharemot kedoshim, after the holy ones, the kedoshim in Hebrew, after the holy ones have passed away, emor. We have to be the speakers for them. We have to tell their story. We have to fill in the gap that will be left by their passing. So that's the first Derek Haritz lesson, to say nice things after somebody has passed away, and also to continue the stories of people we love. Here, it's specifically talking about those victims of the Holocaust or anybody, anybody who we call Kiddoshim in Hebrew, the holy and the pure, uh, victims of terror. Uh, people in that kind of a category, once they're gone, who will tell their story? And the answer is we. We have to tell their story. We have to continue their legacy, their story, their intricate and integral part of history. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is in Leviticus. It's chapter 18, verse 5 in Leviticus. I always thought it was like a dog's name. Here, Leviticus. Leviticus. No, no, no. No, come. Anyway, it's a uh, name of a book. It's the name of the five, one of the five books of Moses. Here's what it says in Hebrew, and then I'll translate into English. Ushamartem et chukotai viet mishpatai. You shall keep my laws and my ordinances. Asher yaase otam ha'adam, that which a person will carry out. Vachai bahem, and you shall live by them. Ani Hashem, I am the Lord your God. That's the, the important part of this teaching, Vachai Bahem, the laws, the statutes, etc. You shall live by them. So what does that mean? And what's that got to do with, uh, with uh, any lesson of Derek Heretz? So uh, the traditional understanding of you shall live by them is that all of these laws and statutes, etc., they should be part of your life. In other words, they shouldn't be external to your daily living, Weave them into your daily life, all the laws, statutes, uh, etc. Leave, weave them as part of your daily life. Uh, another understanding of this is that vachai bahem, and you shall live by them, it means to say that with all the laws, uh, etc., the morals and values in the Torah, the people have to live with each other by them. You have to live by them as a community. Uh, you have to be amicable with each other. Amicable. Amicable? I think so. It's a lodge. Isn't that kind of a lodge? If I was in it, I would be extra lodge. Anyway, you have to be amicable. We have to get along with each other. With the laws of the Torah, they are meant to help us as a society get along with each other, be nice and kind and sensitive with each other. To the point that if we don't, if we don't use our Torah laws that way, we have to re-examine what we're doing. You know, if we're not getting together and we're not friendly with each other, we're not kind and at least tolerant of each other, then I, I, I can't say there's something wrong with the law because we believe the law of God is perfect and immutable. But if we're not a better society because of it, then I think we have to examine us. We have to examine ourselves. And in that sense, Vachai Bahem, these laws are meant for a community, a society to live by them and not despise each other by them. We have to enhance life, enrich life, and not tear it down because of all these laws. Vachai Bahem also means that you have to live because of these laws and not die because of these laws. So, for example, let's say it's Shabbat. On Shabbat, there are various kinds of laws that restrict our activities so that we can enjoy a more spiritual Shabbat, a more spiritual Sabbath. 
Now, let's say uh, on a Shabbat, we don't use a phone in the traditional Jewish community. We don't drive, etc. Uh, let's say, God forbid, somebody's not well, somebody's gotten sick. You need to call an ambulance or maybe you take you want to take the person in your car so they can get to the hospital quicker. Ah, uh, you're not supposed to drive on Shabbat in traditional Jewish community. What do you do? Drive on Shabbat. <laughs> live. You have to live because of these laws, not die because of these laws. So if you, out of the 613 commandments, if you have to break 610 of them, go ahead and do it. If there's urgency, extreme urgency, go ahead and do it. Break the law if you need to. There are three that are reserved that we don't break the law, not for now, because we don't have a lot of time. But with those 610, if you need to break those laws, because there's an urgent need to do so, so that you can continue living, continue life, v'chai bahem, you must live by these laws and not die because of these laws. The other part of it, is v'chai bahem, the, the interpretation by many of our great rabbis is v'chai bahem, you shall live by them, that each and every commandment that we do needs its own life, enthusiasm, energy. Imagine if God gave us all of these laws and we just kind of, uh, okay, well, you know, lackadaisical, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, there's no gusto, there's no eagerness, there's no joy in it. We were meant to have joy and life, life, rejuvenation because of these laws. And we should do the laws as much as we can, as much as possible, with a great sense of joy and happiness, God-given. God meant something with these laws. And v'chai bahem, we should feel a sense of joy and rejuvenation and uh, and excitement when we do the mitzvot, when we do the various laws. So that's Derech Eretz lesson number two. Number three involves something that in the Torah portions that we read this week, it involves Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, the most holy day of the Jewish year. In Part of the procedure, what the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, the big kahuna, uh, part of what the high priest does on that day to uh, get atonement for the Jewish people, for himself, for the, the house of the Kohens, and also for the entire Jewish nation, he has to take two he-goats, two he-goats. Those of you that are more uh, uh, involved with farming, etc., there's probably a name for a he-goat. But in the Torah, they call it he-goats. <laughs> <laughs> and she goats wherever he goats, I'm I'm pretty sure. Anyway, so what happens? The Kohen has to take two he goats, and he has to take two pieces of paper. Maybe they're not two pieces of paper, two things. And he has to pick these two things out of a, I don't know, hat, out of something. One will say to God, and the other one will say to Azazel, which is... Uh, one of these he goats is going to be offered as a sacrifice. The other one of these he goats is also going to meet its demise by being escorted to a cliff. And thank you for not asking me what happens at the cliff. Okay? You'll have to read your cliff notes. All right? So here's here's the story. He has to take, again, two pieces of paper, two somethings. On one head of the he goat, it says to God as a sacrifice. On the other head of the he-goat, it says to Azazel. It's going to meet its demise in another very, very different kind of a way. So uh, this, I mention this because this is reminiscent of two other pieces of paper that are supposed to help us be Derech Eretz people, okay? Here is a quote from Rabbi Simcha Bunim of Pshisch. <laughs> Good luck with that. Okay, if you're going to say it now, I'm going to move away. Pshisch. Okay, thank you. I th Pshis must be in Russia, Poland. I really don't know. Uh, here's what he said. Everybody should have two pockets, at least two pockets. This is Rabbi Simcha Bunim of Pshisch. Okay, everybody should have two pockets in order to be able to have a piece of paper in each of these two pockets. Okay, one piece of paper says in Hebrew, I'll translate, Bishvili nivraha olam. The entire world was created for me. 
Nice. The entire world was created for me. Uh, this is a notion that's taken from the Mishnah in the tractate of the Talmud called Sanhedrin. So that's a piece of paper with that message in one pocket. The world was created for me. And in the other pocket, there's a piece of paper that says, Va'anochi afar va'efer. Behold, I am only dust and ashes. Wow, interesting. I'm only dust and ashes. That's what God, uh, Abraham said to God when he was fighting for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, on the one hand, you have a piece of paper that says the entire world was created for me, heady, pretty big ego, wow. And the other piece of paper says exactly the opposite, it seems, that I am only dust and ashes. What is the message that is being taught here by Rabbi Meir Simcha Bunim of Pshisch? Got to, I love the name. He's telling us that with having these two pieces of paper in our pockets, it should affect our self-image. You know, there are a lot of people who walk around, they wear a bow tie because they feel they're God's gift to the world. So it's like a bow. They're the gift. <laughs> Here's the bow. Uh, a lot of people walk around like they are the uh, the end all of everything. They are super ego. And other people walk around feeling like uh, they're nobodies. They are nobody. And why does God even pay attention to them? Why do people pay attention to them? High self-image, very low self-image. So Rabbi Simcha Bunim is telling us that Walking with these two pieces of paper and looking at them occasionally, so you remind yourself, life is a balance. Life is a balance between these two opposite poles, between having a very, very healthy ego, too healthy, and health having almost no ego at all. So how does this help you in Derek Haaretz? Well, it keeps you in balance. It keeps you in balance. You're, when you've got this mastered, people will know the difference in how you're behaving. Wow, yeah, I remember this guy used to be like a, wow, what an ego head. And now, now he seems so normal. He seems so approachable, accessible, not like he's in a high tower. So finding the balance, not easy, but it's finding the balance between these two opposite poles. I the entire word was created for me. And on the other hand, I am a nothing. Find the balance and people will know when you have found the balance. They will know that you're the type of a person that is not at either extreme, but is nice, kind, pleasant, feels good about themselves. Good. That's fine. And doesn't always feel like they are the local welcome mat for everybody and their uh, moods. So that's another Another Derek Hart's lesson. The fourth one, I'm just checking the time. I'm checking the time again. The fourth Derek Hart's lesson is something that we see on Israeli buses at the very front of the bus. I don't mean the bus driver, right behind the bus driver. Israeli buses in general, they have like two seats facing the street on one side, two seats facing the other side, facing the street. And there is a sign above both of these seats that asks people to be um, cognizant of the fact that elderly will want to sit here so that they are not having to schlep all the way to the back of the bus and find a seat. In other words, save these seats here for the elderly. And there is a, a sign in Hebrew, in Hebrew words, and it says the following, taken straight from our uh, Torah reading this week of Kedoshim. It says, Mipnei sevat takum, Vahadarta pene zaken. You shall honor the presence of a sage, and before the elderly you shall rise. Mipne sevatakum. You shall rise in the presence of the elderly. Vahadarta pene zaken. You shall give honor literally to the face, but it means to the presence of one who is elderly. I'll tell you something. I love that. I love that. Um, very often those four front seats on the Israeli buses are either left empty for the elderly, so they don't have to schlep and they can be assured of a seat, or sometimes people sit in them and then when somebody elderly gets on the bus, they will evacuate that seat so that the elderly can be seated. 
This is a, a, a beautiful, beautiful idea. When I was living in Mitzpenevo, the uh, neighborhood in Malay Adumim, before about a year ago, my wife and I were living there, uh, right across the street there was a Sephardi shul, a shul of the Sephardi uh, heritage, and one of the things I really liked about it, it, it was not a big synagogue. It was a rather small-ish synagogue. One of the things I really liked about it is that when anybody saw somebody of age come through the door, people would stand. Can you believe that? They would just rise. Rise. They were out of honor and respect, adoration for age. Wow. Wow. I, re I like that. Uh, one of the reasons I like to go to that, that synagogue is because everybody did that. So that to me was a, a very, very special atmosphere. Now imagine today, um, now I, I just want to say quickly that in schools of higher Jewish learning today, and perhaps even some Jewish day schools, they train that the students, whenever a rabbi walks in to start their class or just to visit, when a rabbi walks in, everybody rises. In other seminaries where they have perhaps women or young ladies studying and the women uh, instructors come in, they instruct all the students to rise, to give honor and respect not only to age, but also to scholarship, to give honor and respect to knowledge, God's knowledge. Imagine how the atmosphere in a classroom would be different uh, if perhaps uh, people walked in when their algebra teacher came in. People stood when their algebra teacher came in. So you say, isn't that carrying this a little bit too far? And I would say no. Algebra, also a knowledge that came from God. We didn't just find it. <laughs> Those who are experts in their field, imagine if a class stood up when the instructor came in. I, I agree with you that it's it's mostly for like, you know, holy uh, classes, uh, uh, etc. But just imagine the atmosphere of the class, how different it would be if scholarship was recognized. Yeah, here comes the English teacher. We should stand. I don't know if you're going to agree with me on this. And if you don't, I'm happy to hear your comments, which I will delete as soon as I, I would not do that. Maybe I would. No, I would not do that because I respect everybody's uh, opinion. So that is Derek Hart's lesson number four, that when we see people who are elderly, who are coming towards us uh, in the house, whatever, uh, to rise, to give respect and honor, not only to age, but also to give respect and honor to scholarship. Uh, the last lesson I have tonight for Derek Haritz is, uh, it's, it's something that everybody knows. I, I'm going to trust that everybody has heard of this phrase, which is found in Leviticus, here Leviticus, Leviticus 19, verse 18, okay? And uh, I'm going to show you what an important verse this is, because here I have the stone chumash, okay? It's a very popular chumash, and I'm going to show you that where this verse is found in this chumash, uh, do you see that it's, I don't know if you can see this, it's practically smack in the middle of the chumash, this is the five books of Moses. The, the verse or the phrase I'm going to tell you about right now is smack in the middle. I, I'm not saying exact, but you can, you can see half the pages are on one side, half the pages on the other, and it's almost balanced right in the middle, right where this phrase is. And I did that because I want to tell you how central this phrase is to Jewish living, to Jewish teaching, ethics, and morals. And I'm sure it goes beyond Judaism. This is something that's applicable to any religion, um, I believe. And here's the phrase. In Hebrew, V'yahavta l'reacha kamocha. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we're going to talk in a moment about different things that that means. And I want to end uh, within the half hour. I mean, by nine o'clock or two o'clock, whatever it is where you are. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So there are some Jewish prayer books that as part of the early morning prayers, they have the following phrase printed in the prayer book. I can't say I found it in many prayer books because I haven't. But here and there I find it. And here's what it says. It says that every day a person should begin their prayers and begin their day, 
at some point in the beginning of the day by saying, Hineni muchan umzuman, behold, I am ready, willing, and prepared during this day to fulfill the mitzvah, to fulfill the commandment of ve'ahavta l'reacha kamocha. Behold, I am prepared at this beginning point of the day to spend the rest of the day fulfilling the commandment of you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'm telling you, I wish this was printed in the beginning of every Jewish prayer book. It's not. Most of the ones I've prayed from do not have it. The ones that do have it, I find it tremendously precious. Imagine that. That's the focus of your, the early focus of your day is to just love people to admire and appreciate God's creations, to love that, that part of God, that eternal part of God, that spark of the divine that's in each and every person. Imagine leaving the house or even with family and, and friends in your neighborhood. Imagine having that focus right away in the very, very outset before you step into all of your activities. I am ready prepared and willing to fulfill the commandment of you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what does that mean in the last five or so minutes that we have? Can we really love everybody? You know, can we? I mean, can we Can we talk? Can we talk? Can we really love everybody? And the answer is the saints among us can love everybody. But how many how many saints are there among us? especially in the Jewish traditions, uh, there's humans who are saints, but it's a saintly thing to do, to love everybody. So um, one aspect of you shall love your neighbor as yourself is to at least wish others the same success and prosperity as you would wish for yourself, to wish them the same. I don't know if I love them that much, but at least minimally, I wish the other person and I'll help them if I can to have the same success, prosperity, respect as I would want for myself. Uh, to treat each other with respect, at least respect, at least to treat each other with kindness and sensitivity. And exactly what the Torah says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I have to tell you, in the last 10 to 15 years, when I've taught this teaching, this beautiful moral and ethical teaching, only in the last 15 years did somebody, it's almost predictable, that somebody in the class would raise their hand and say, you can probably mouth it along with me, they would say, what if I don't like myself? What if I don't like myself? Am I obligated to love others? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Whether you love yourself or... You see, the Torah assumed, God assumed, that we have... a a modicum of love for ourselves. But if you don't have love for yourself, that should not stop you from loving and appreciating uh, and being sensitive and kind to other people. Let me close with a teaching from Rabbi Avraham Yehoshua Heschel of Kopchinitz. How do you like that? Kopchinitz. Not pshisch. <laughs> Kopchinitz. Rabbi Avraham Yehoshua Heschel of Kopchinitz. Here's what he had to say, and with this we will close our session tonight. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's very easy if your neighbor is lovable. If they're lovable, it's a no-brainer. What it really means to say is, is that you also have to love the ones who are hard to love. Love the ones who are hard to love. And that's already... A war. That's, a, that's a job, to love the ones who are hard to love. And so we, we try to look, take a look at people in our society who have all different kinds of things, go through all different kinds of experiences, etc. And the ones who look hard to love, the ones who seem hard to love, that's a good place to put our efforts. The more, what's the, what's the uh, idea? The more love we give them, the more they will come to love themselves. And when they love themselves, they're not going to be that hard to love. Dear friends, I hope you enjoyed today's session. Uh, try to tune with uh, tune in on Monday night or Monday afternoon, this coming Monday. Mondays, 8.30 in Israel time, 
1.30 Eastern uh, Daylight Saving Time in America. Wednesday nights here, five Derek Haritz lessons in the weekly Torah portion, uh, as well as um, 8.30 at night here in Israel, 1.30 Eastern Standard Daylight Saving, whatever you call it, in America. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Have a great, great week. Happy birthday, Israel. Again, 72. And happy birthday to my dear Aunt Bracha, who is 90 years old. God bless her today. Take care, everybody. Have a great week and enjoy the Torah portions and eventually Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye now.